We are The Point, a church that loves God, loves people, and loves life. If you are interested in learning more about us, please go to our website, thepointva.com. Thanks for listening. So Carrie and I were talking on the way over the last time that we were up uh, sharing together. It was actually the morning that we made the announcement that we were expecting our fourth child. And, um, and so just we're so not. we're clear. Uh, we're not expecting it. Nothing that exciting happening uh, this morning, no. but, uh, but it is so cool to be back and to, share, uh, to ta- have this time together this morning sharing. Yes. And because we're in the third week of our rom-com series, we thought we would start off by sharing our favorite uh, rom-com. So, Love, why don't you go first, your okay. favorite? So last week you mentioned Run- Runaway Bride. Yep. I like that one. Anybody else? Runaway Bride? <laughs> Those are a little old. Three of you? Good. Okay. <laughs> the Wedding Planner was, yeah, yeah that- see, yeah. And I probably haven't watched one since then. Yeah. So however many years ago that's been. Um, so yeah, how about you? Uh, Rudy. <laughs> that doesn't count. Lord of the Rings. <laughs> Which was on last night. <laughs> <laughs> no, it would, it would be, you were right. The Runaway Bride and The Wedding Planner. Um, uh, probably the last ones that I watched as well. <laughs> so, so all right, we're going to dive in. And so why don't, um, first of all, just because I don't know that we've ever really shared our entire story of, of how we met and, and fell in love and uh, began dating and, and engagement. So why don't you begin by just kind of sharing that with everyone? Okay. So we actually met through my brother who um, years ago lived in Virginia and actually taught and coached and led worship with Gabriel at the, their local church. And so we met through my brother and I'll never forget the very first night I ever met um, Gabriel. We were going to a, um, I think it was a youth, uh, yeah, you, was you were preach. speaking, yep. preach at a, a youth event. Anyways, when, when we got back to my, my brother's um, place, I just remember in my heart that night, God said, that's, you're going to marry him. So it was really just love at first sight. And I know that sounds crazy, but I just knew in my heart that we were going to get married. And so I was getting ready to start my senior year of college back in my home state of West Virginia. So I just, I went and did my senior year of college. And all through that year, I just really, um, I just looked to the Lord and, and, uh, and we never talked or we would see each other every once in a while if I'd come to visit my brother. And, um, but I finished my senior year of college, graduated, and I moved to Virginia <laughs> immediately. <laughs> like I said, we, we weren't talking, we weren't dating, we barely knew each other. But I, in my heart, I knew that this was God, what God had for me. And let me just say that I didn't just um, wish for this and hope for it over that those months. I really prayed and sought the Lord and was asking him, Lord, what's my next step? Father, I trust you. What do you want me to do next when I graduate college? Because more than a boyfriend, more than marriage, more than all of that, I wanted to please God. And I wanted to be where he wanted me to be because I knew that would be best. That's so awesome. So what happened is, is that Carrie came, moved to Virginia, and uh, we were actually serving together on the worship team. Um, and that's how we got to know each other. And what was really cool about Carrie, and um, I think you'll understand this when I say it, that she was good with or without me. And I think a lot of times, uh, a lot of us are fixers and we want to get into, or we, we gravitate towards relationships where we can fix. Um, because we like to fix and because we find our value in fixing. And um, the problem with that mindset is, is that you live long enough and you realize that you can't fix anybody. That's right. You can't even fix yourself. And really what that is, is a codependency issue. And so you gravitate towards uh, relationships that end up being dysfunctional. Why? Because you want to fix, you want to control. And in the process of doing it, you can easily make more of a mess out of it than anything. Uh, more of a mess out of the other person, more of a mess out of, out of yourself. And that's why I say with Carrie, like she was really good or with or without me. It was uh, unlike anything that I had ever experienced before. And so I'll just give you an example. Uh, when she would lead worship, okay, we would lead worship together. She would walk down off the stage, and I'll never forget it. Then she would go out into the hallway, and she would walk down the hallway, and she would um, serve in our nursery. And just a servant heart through and through, just all in on Jesus. And I got to tell you that, like, that in her, I just, like, it, it just blew my mind. 
um, it's just my heart. I, I remember very, very vividly the moment that I realized like I had fallen in love with you even before we started dating. And um, it was just a really, really amazing, amazing, amazing experience. And so with that said, uh, we dated just three months, right? Yeah. Three months. Yeah. And um, in the course of that time, we realized like we just, we wanted to spend the rest of our lives together. And so after three months of dating, we got engaged. Now, keep in mind, we had served together many, many, many months, okay, leading up until then. And so, um, but we got engaged and we had a short engagement, six months of engagement. And I'll never forget, obviously, the night we got engaged, um, one, because we got engaged. And then number two, uh, (laughs) that night I had, uh, it was Christmas night of 2003. I drove all the way back to her family's home in West Virginia um, through a huge blizzard, big snowstorm. And um, like, you know, make it sound a lot bigger than than what it was at the time. But no, it was uh, going through Elkins. I'll never forget. I'm like, am I going to make it back there tonight? And so anyways, got back to her home and that entire trip, okay, a six hour drive back to her home. I listened to a six part series, a teaching series on the Song of Solomon uh, by Pastor Tommy Nelson from Denton Bible. Church. Now, some of you have asked, very good question, hey, what resources would you recommend for anyone that's dating, anyone that's engaged, anyone that wants to date or wants to get engaged, or even married couples? Without question, one of the best teaching series I've ever heard. It's a six-part series. It's called, um, it's on the Song of Solomon by Pastor Tommy Nelson. In fact, for everybody who's watching online, we're actually going to share that with you uh, right now, the link to that. And for everyone else, we'll get you that link after uh, the, after the 11 o'clock service this morning. But by far, the best teaching series I've ever heard on relationships. And so uh, we got engaged uh, that night, Christmas night, and... Um, Why don't you take it from there? So we were only engaged six months and we got married. And (laughs) our thought was, if you have six months to plan a wedding, you'll take six months. If you have a year, you'll take a year. We were both out of college. We had jobs. We were just ready for the next step. We knew we wanted to spend the rest of our lives together. So it was, it was why wait? So so we got a really good question um, regarding our finances when it came to engagement. And the question was along the lines of like, how did you guys make financial decisions in that season? And um, the answer to that is, is that we didn't combine our finances until after we were married, but we made sure that the foundational piece of our financial world is in place. Now, this isn't going to sound very romantic, but I cannot overstate this principle that I'm about to teach you and tell you about. And that is the principle of the tithe, returning to Jesus the first tenth of your income. And this was critical. It was critical for me personally. It was critical for Carrie. And it was critical for our marriage before we took this step into marriage. And here's the reason why. I'm going to share with you from Matthew 6.21 for just a moment. Jesus says this, for where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Now, some of you are thinking, of course, like take a discussion on marriage and find a way to talk about money, right? But we know that the number one stress on marriage is finances. Yeah. Yeah. That's right. We know that. Everywhere you look, that's what's being said. The number one stress on marriage is finances. And what I'm saying is, is like we can't keep doing the same thing the same way over and over and expect a different result. All right. And so when we talk about the tithe, okay, what Jesus says, where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Very simply, your heart follows your money. And when my finances are aligned with the kingdom of God, guess where my heart goes? Is with the kingdom of God. It's the it's it's really even a bigger discussion than finances. It's the doctrine of the preeminence of Christ, that Christ must be first. He is Lord, he is king, and he must be first. You realize that, right? There's never a situation in which he can be second. Jesus must be first. Now, our lives don't always reflect that, all right? But that's the nature of following Jesus, is that little by little, every area of our life comes into alignment with that truth. What does it look like for Jesus to be first? And so for us, we knew that it was critical for our finances, 
all right, to be, for Jesus to be first in our financial world, which is the tithe. In fact, he goes on to say in verse 24, no one can serve two masters. Either he will hate the one and love the other, or he will be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve both God and the devil. Now, is that what he said? No, you can't serve God and money. Because God's greatest competitor for your heart is not the devil. It's your stuff. And the reason that this principle is so critical in marriage is is because what my wife needs from her husband and what I need from my wife is I need our hearts in complete alignment with the kingdom of God. All right. This is the principle of of the tithe. And so um, while we didn't join our finances together until after marriage, this was a principle that was critical. All right. It was critical to our 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 marriage and and the health of our marriage. In fact, over the years, um, we've had our share of arguments and disagreements and so on, like every other couple. But I can honestly tell you this sitting here that we have never, ever in our 15 years of marriage had an argument over finances. Ever. All right, and it's not us. It's just a foundational decision to make sure that Jesus is first in our financial world. And there's a lot of you out here, you want to amen that right now, don't you? You should want to amen it, all right? That was your opportunity to say amen, everybody. Um, <laughs> amen. So this is why, again, we're talking about finances, but this is why here at The Point, we give you that 90-day tithing challenge. In fact, I'm going to put the link on the, on the screen for you because if you're maybe on that verge of like, should we have this? Should we, should we trust God financially? Like, should we try the tithe? And look, we'll give you the guarantee, like try it for three months. Try it for 90 days as a couple or even as a single person. You don't have to be married to do this. Like it's just start now, but try it now. And it, let me just tell you, if you're not more blessed at the end of the 90 days, then just send an email to us and Pastor Dave, our executive pastor, will make sure you get all your money back. Because this is the one area where God says, try me and see. Yeah. Yeah. See. Yeah. Try to outgive me yeah. and see. You say the first tenth. It yeah. does take faith, right? Yeah. It takes faith. But I'm just telling you that we have seen it time and time and time again in our marriage. And it's not just financially, but how you cannot outgive God. Yeah. You can't do it. That's right. The other thing I would say about your finances is I would say be secure enough to get advice from someone whose financial world you want yours to look like. Yes, that's right. All right, don't guess your way through finan- their financial world. Like find someone whose world you, you want yours to look like and, and ask them, how did they get there? And so for us, we were very blessed because my father is one of the wisest person I know uh, when it comes to finances and has done an amazing job of stewarding how all that God has blessed him with. And so that's been a very, very... Um, a very huge source of wisdom for us, not just getting married, but also throughout all of our financial decisions throughout marriage. So we all need that. Yeah, that's right. All right, let's dive into Ephesians 5 for just a moment because um, as we wrap up this discussion on marriage and this, uh, this, this picture, this puzzle that we've been building out week by week over the first few weeks of this series, what we're gonna do now is we're gonna dive into Ephesians 5 and we're gonna actually get to the marriage passage, all right, which, which is what we probably have all been, all been waiting on. And so Ephesians chapter 5, beginning with verse number 21, and we're starting in verse number 21 because of how critical this verse is to the rest of the passage. Verse 21, submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. Now, that's the basis for this passage of marriage. And let me just tell you how countercultural the teaching of Paul that we're about to read is. All right. In the, in the Greco-Roman world that Paul is writing into, men had two responsibilities. They were to provide food and they were to provide shelter for their families. And if men could provide food and shelter for their families, then everything else was fair game. Cultural standards, everything. They didn't have to be present physically, emotionally, spiritually, mentally, in any way. If they could provide food and shelter for their families, they were good. They were considered successful men. Now that's important. 
Because what we see Jesus doing and the kingdom doing and Paul doing here and echoing here is that he raises the standard on what it looks like to be a man, a man after God's heart. Okay, and so a lot of times what we're about to read, we think of it as uh, devaluing women, and that's not the case at all. In fact, what Jesus did and what Paul echoes is that he actually raised the value of women. While the, the culture said that women were a commodity, Paul says, no, 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 no. You're missing the heart of the kingdom, okay? And so that's why he says in verse 21, submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. Yeah, and I love the Passion Translation of this verse. It says, and out of your reverence for Christ, be supportive of each other in love. And that's huge. You know, out of your submission to Christ, you're, you're supporting one another in, in that love. So I'll go ahead and read, um, start with verse 22. It says, wives, submit to your own husbands as to the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church, his body, and is himself its savior. Now, as the church submits to Christ, so also wives should submit to everything to their husbands. So when I read that and I think about submission and what that looks like for us, when I think about submission to Gabriel, I think about ways to do that. And I think about that I am going to honor him. I'm going to be honoring to him. And I'm going to be fully devoted to my husband. And I'm going to be respectful with my words and with my actions. And not only in our home am I going to be respectful with my words and my actions, but I'm going to be respectful when I'm out too, in front of family, in front of friends, in front of coworkers, I'm going to be respectful to him with my words and with my actions. I'll insert this that I think is probably one of the things that breaks our hearts the most is, and it could go either way, but, mm -hmm. and you've seen this where you're in public and a husband and wife, when they dishonor one another, yes, just with their words or with their attitudes, it's heartbreaking. And it's like, really, does that make you want to be a better husband? Does that make you want to be a better, a better wife? Yeah. Your words have the power of life and death. That's scripture. So if you're, if you're slandering or you're cutting down your, your death, that's, that's right there. But if you're honoring and you're respectful and you're, you're giving life and you're building that person up, you're supporting them. I think of another way of submission, just listening. You know, listen to one another. Um, just be supporting in all things and, and just be an encouragement um, I'm going to be an encouragement to my husband. So those are just some of the ways when I think about submission, um, ways to submit practically to my husband. But I love in this verse, it says, as to the Lord. Yeah, that's the key. So first, we have to be fully surrendered and submitted to Christ. If we're, we can't submit to our, our my, I can't submit to my husband if I'm not fully submitted and surrendered to Christ and willing to obey everything he tells me. So love, I will tell you that probably one of the ways that I've seen you live this out, um, just another practical example, is early in our marriage and even before we planted the point, I would go and preach it at many different churches and I would preach revival services, you know, like you know, three, four, five night revivals. How many, how many of you remember those days, right? So I would preach revivals or I would go and preach homecoming services on Sunday mornings. And uh, the, uh, what's so nice about being a guest speaker, okay? I'll just kind of let you in a little preacher secret. Um, what's great about being a guest speaker is that like we have our four or five best sermons. <laughs> and we preach those four or five sermons over and over and over again. <laughs> And so um, just for those of you that have heard, maybe heard me preach at, a, at another church before and you're like, you, you heard me preach and I kind of feel bad for the pastor sometimes because it's like, they're coming up to you and like, that was the best sermon I've ever heard in my life. What they don't know is I've preached it like a hundred times, okay? <laughs> so anyways, I say all that to say this. I don't know if I've ever told you this, maybe I've mentioned it before, but I can't tell you, okay, how many times my wife has sat on a front row of a church and listened to me preach those same sermons over and over and over and over again. And you know what makes me feel honored? Is that every time she heard me preach those same sermons over and over and over and over again, she is sitting on the front row with her notebook open, taking notes as if she's hearing this for the very first time. Good every time, too. 
<laughs> it got better, right? <laughs> yeah. 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 But I'm just giving you like a practical example of what that looks like in our world. So like, what would the equivalent of that look like in your home? What's the equivalent of you listening to your husband preach the same sermon for the hundredth time over and acting like you've heard it for the first time? And so anyways, that's been huge. Um, just an example of that. I'll, uh, I'll, I'm going to jump down to verse number 25 now. So let's, let me just speak to the husbands a little bit. Paul says in verse 25, husbands to love your wives just as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her. So keep this in mind that th this word submission, okay, which is a theme throughout the passage, it's a military term, okay? And so for all of you who are in the military or, um, or you, you serve with the police force or, or, or any, any really type of like hierarchy, if you're in that, 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 uh, in that world, you know that there's, there's a, a hierarchy, right? That, that uh, chain of command. And so what Paul says is he uses the word submission and what it means is it means to arrange yourself underneath of. It's a military term, okay? And so if there's Christ at the top, all right, that's why what Carrie pointed out is so critical is because you're arranging yourself under Jesus, wives. Whether your husband is aligned with Jesus or not, you're aligned with Jesus. Do you see the difference? Okay. Now, what he says to husbands is, is to love your wives. And don't miss this. Because love is the greatest form of submission that there is. There is no greater form of submission than love. In fact, when Jesus said in John 15, 13, greater love has no man than this and a man laid down his life for his friends. This is the love we're talking about here. So he says to love your, your wives, how? As Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her to make her holy, cleansing her by the washing with water through the word and to present her to himself as a radiant church without stain or wrinkle or any other blemish, yeah. but holy and blameless. And here's what's cool. Is that the love that Jesus displayed for his church, it was so that the church could be everything that God wanted the church to be. And let me just tell you something, men, that our calling as men and as husbands is so that I can champion my wife to be all that God has created her to be and called her to be. You see, again, we're turning like the world standards upside down in a lot of ways. And there's a lot of us, and this is just good leadership, that we've got to make a transition in our life from a, from a mindset of success to a mindset of significance. Success is about you. Significance is about others. And there has to be a point in your growth and your maturity where your life is no longer about you. It's about others. And when you take that step into marriage, this is what Paul is saying, that, that, that I want my wife to shine. I want my wife to glow. Now, I'm going to tell you something. The glow that you see on my wife, like that was there even before we got married, okay? But I will just tell you, that my job as a husband is to make sure that she glows, that she shines with the glory of God, that she comes alive with the glory of God. And then whatever it takes, whatever it looks like to champion her and what God has called her to do and what God has called her to be. That's what leadership in the kingdom looks like. As your responsibilities increase in the kingdom, your rights diminish. Servant leadership. Now, one thing that we've got to be very clear on is that the love that, that, that Paul is speaking about here, it's not always dramatic. And I think that's where a lot of times we, we miss this or we don't make a connection, that the love of Jesus, as it works, it plays itself out relationally with my wife and marriage, it's not always this big dramatic moment. So here's what I mean. That sometimes what it looks like is early in the morning, I'm an early riser. Sometimes what it looks like is, is that I know that the dishwasher ran the night before. So rather than leaving the clean dishes in the dishwasher, what I'm going to do is I'm going to make time early that next morning to empty the dishwasher for my wife. Now, there's a lot of things I want to do with that time. A lot of studying I could do, a lot of writing I could do. But every so often, I need to, in that moment, lay my life down 
So that's what that could look like. In the evenings, all right, when I'm exhausted, rather than vegging out in front of the television, what if I actually stayed in the kitchen and engaged in conversation with my wife after dinner? Or, all right, or what if I said, honey, why don't you sit down while I take care of the dishes? You know what I'm saying? Like love is not always a dramatic thing. It's not always something that's going to make the headlines, all right? So th- these are just a few examples of what, of what this, this could look like. But Paul says that, that in the same way, verse 28, husbands ought to love their wives as their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves him himself. Now, I'll just say this, that what that means is, is men, husbands, let's be extraordinary in the ordinary. Yes, that's right. yeah. Let's be extraordinary in the world that no one else will ever see. That's right. yeah. People pay attention to the public world, but what about the private world that no one ever sees? What if we were committed to be extraordinary in that world? And really, I believe that that's what Paul is talking about here. So, love, as we get ready to kind of wrap up our time, um, why don't you, because we recognize this, because we pray for a lot of you, that um, many of you wives, you have husbands who are not walking with Jesus. So what do you do when you're a wife, you're trying to follow Jesus, but you have a husband who isn't? What, what do you do? Yeah, you got to stay close to Jesus. For sure. Um, you're going to find your strength in him and him alone. And pray. Pray for your husband continually. Pray without ceasing, as the word says, because um, one, one minute with Jesus can change your husband in what you've been trying to do for months or years. Yes. All it takes is one touch from Jesus. Yes. So I just want to encourage you with this scripture in 1 Peter 3. And this is actually from the message version. But listen to this. 1 Peter 3, starting with verse 1, it says this. The same goes for you, wives. Be good wives to your husbands, responsive to their needs. There are husbands who, indifferent as they are to any words about God, will be captivated by your life of holy beauty. What matters is not your outer appearance, the styling of your hair, the jewelry you wear, the cut of your clothes, but your inner disposition. Mm. Cultivate inner beauty, the gentle, gracious kind that God delights in. Mm. So good. I think it's so point, uh, such a good point, what Carrie just said, and I'll echo it, that a lot of you, <laughs> like you're at your wit's end, like trying to change someone, and you can't. But it's like Carrie just said, God can do in an instant what you've been trying to manufacture and engineer over months or over years of time. And so bring him before the Lord. The last thing that I want to conclude with or or close with is is what encouragement would I give to all of our men? And really what I want to do is I want to echo what it is I said yesterday in our men's conference, which by the way, wasn't that men's conference awesome yesterday? It was incredible. Yeah. Give God a big hand. Amen. It was awesome. So here's what I want to do is I want to echo what I shared yesterday. And basically I gave the men two challenges. Number one, to return to drinking from the well of Jesus. The well of Jesus. A lot of us are unhealthy in our soul because we're drinking from an unhealthy water source. And your soul reflects it. And your life is starting to reflect it. You're frustrated, you're anxious, you're irritable all the time. It's not a once a day or once every so often type of thing. It's like an everyday type of thing. And it's time to return to drinking from the well of Jesus. And the second thing that I would say is this, is you recommit to drinking from the well of your wife. And that's not just a physical thing, it's a thing with your eyes as well. Proverbs says in in Proverbs 5, to drink from your own well. Drink from your own well. And so what we wanna do is we wanna bring every area of our life into alignment with Jesus, with the kingdom of God. So why Jesus said to seek first his kingdom and his righteousness. And what happens? All these other things will fall into the right place. So what does it look like? What's it look like to make sure that Jesus is first in your day? That you're getting up and you're giving him some time in the word, some time in prayer. What's it look like to make sure Jesus is first in your week? You're living that out this morning. 
All right? We're not just coming and pressing a seat for an hour once a week. Do you realize this is a practical expression of saying, Jesus, you are first in this week. Are you with me? What's it look like for Jesus to be first in your financial world? What's it look like to begin to bring every area of our lives into alignment with the reality that Jesus is first? And when we do, the promise from God is, is that everything else in life that you're after is going to fall into its proper place. Amen? So what I want to do as we wrap up this morning is I want to give us an opportunity to make a decision for Jesus for the very first time. And if you've never made that decision today, you want to say yes to Jesus for the first time. I'm going to give you that opportunity right now as we close. Um, as we wrap up in just a moment, Carrie's going to lead us in a final um, song of worship in response to the word. So I don't want you to rush out. But right now, um, if you've never trusted Jesus as Lord and Savior, we want to give you that opportunity. And I'm going to lead you in a prayer. And I'm going to invite you or ask you to pray this prayer out loud after me. And I'm going to ask that all of us would pray it out loud together to support those who are making this decision for the very first time today. Let's pray together. Would you pray after me? Heavenly Father, thank you for your son, Jesus. Thank you for sending him to die on the cross for my sin. Come into my heart, cleanse me of my sin, and give me the courage to live for you from this day forward. In Jesus' name, amen.